This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Since pulse oximetry was introduced three decades ago as a monitoring tool, it has become ubiquitous in operating rooms, intensive care units, and hospital wards. Before pulse oximetry was available, physicians relied on invasive procedures, such as arterial blood gas analysis, to identify the presence of hypoxemia. Pulse oximetry has now become the standard of care in operating rooms and intensive care units in the United States and many other nations. Although the pulse oximeter is easy to use, the clinician must understand the principles of pulse oximetry and must know how the equipment works in order to interpret the information it provides. This video demonstrates the equipment needed and how to use it. It also addresses the common applications of pulse oximetry, explains how to interpret the data generated, and presents its limitations as well as common problems encountered with its use. Oxygen is present in two forms in the blood, dissolved and bound to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can be functional or non-functional in terms of oxygen binding and transport. Functional hemoglobin binds and transports oxygen and is present as oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin contains bound oxygen and deoxyhemoglobin is reduced hemoglobin without bound oxygen. Non-functional hemoglobin is unable to bind or transport oxygen and is present as carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin is hemoglobin bound to carbon monoxide. Methemoglobin is hemoglobin that contains ferric iron, Fe3+, an oxidized form of the oxygen carrying ferrous iron, Fe2+, which is found in functional hemoglobin. The partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in arterial blood is termed PaO2. The percent saturation of oxygen bound to hemoglobin in arterial blood is termed SaO2. When measured by a pulse oximeter, SaO2 is termed SpO2. The hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve shows the relation between PaO2 and SaO2. The affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen varies at different partial pressures of oxygen, and although the relation is not linear, increases in PaO2 lead to higher SaO2. In general, 80% saturation corresponds to a PaO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury, and 90% saturation corresponds to a PaO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury. Pulse oximetry is indicated in all clinical settings where hypoxemia may occur, such as operating rooms, intensive care units, post-anesthesia care units, emergency departments and ambulances, endoscopy suites, sleep laboratories, cardiac catheterization laboratories, delivery suites, and wards. The use of pulse oximetry in these settings may reduce the need for arterial blood gas analyses and may guide clinical decision making. There are no contraindications to pulse oximetry, and it is generally safe to use in monitoring all patients. Pulse oximeters consist of a peripheral probe and a small microprocessor unit. Traditionally, the peripheral probe contains a photodetector and two light-emitting diodes. The two light-emitting diodes emit light of different wavelengths. The light emitted by the diodes is absorbed by tissues, and the amount of absorption is determined by the photodetector. Using this information, the microprocessor determines the concentration of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, respectively. It then calculates the percentage of oxyhemoglobin and displays the hemoglobin oxygen saturation in arterial blood, a waveform corresponding to the pulsatile flow in arterial vessels and the heart rate. 
pulse oximeters function on the principle that oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin absorb red and infrared light differently. The light absorption of deoxyhemoglobin is greater at wavelengths of 600 to 800 nanometers, while the light absorption of oxyhemoglobin is greater at wavelengths of 800 to 1000 nanometers. One light-emitting diode emits light in the red spectrum at a wavelength of 660 nanometers, at which the light absorption of deoxyhemoglobin is greater than that of oxyhemoglobin. The other diode emits light in the infrared spectrum at a wavelength of 940 nanometers, at which oxyhemoglobin absorbs more light than deoxyhemoglobin. The microprocessor analyzes the light absorption of the tissues at each wavelength to determine the respective concentrations of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. It then divides the concentration of oxyhemoglobin by the sum of the concentration of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin to determine the arterial blood oxygen saturation, SpO2. The probe is positioned so that the photodetector and light-emitting diodes face each other, with layers of tissue between them. The photodiodes turn on and off several hundred times per second to record the light absorption during pulsatile and non-pulsatile flow. During pulsatile flow, the light absorption of arterial blood, background tissues, and venous blood is detected. During non-pulsatile flow, only the light absorption of background tissues and venous blood is detected. The microprocessing unit compares the light absorption during pulsatile and non-pulsatile flow to isolate the light absorption of arterial blood and thus determine the arterial blood oxygen saturation. Pulse oximetry provides both qualitative and quantitative data. The qualitative data are obtained through the sounds emitted by the pulse oximeter. These sounds correlate with the level of oxygen saturation. A higher pitch indicates higher oxygen saturation, and a lower pitch warns of decreasing oxygen saturation. The pulse oximeter provides quantitative data through the display of a pulsatile waveform that corresponds to the flow of arterial blood. The numbers displayed indicate the hemoglobin oxygen saturation and the pulse. It is important to adhere to standard precautions before any contact with patients. Hand washing is the single most effective strategy to prevent the spread of infections. The ideal site for placement of the pulse oximeter probe is one that is well perfused, relatively immobile, comfortable for the patient, and easily accessible. The earlobes and the fingers are commonly used sites. Feet, cheeks, nose, and tongue may be used in cases of low peripheral perfusion. In adults, the probe can be placed on either side of the body. In newborns, however, placement on the right upper arm is preferable because of the possibility of a patent ductus arteriosus. Blood flowing to the right upper arm is the least diluted by the shunt and is therefore the most oxygenated. It is important to choose a probe that is the right size for the patient. If the probe is not the right size, the light-emitting diodes may not line up correctly with the photodetector and will provide inaccurate data. For example, a probe that is too large for a patient's finger may slip and the light may not pass completely across the finger. Venous pulsations may occur if a probe is too small or is placed too tightly on the finger. These venous pulsations will produce interference, resulting in a falsely low pulse oximeter reading. Pulse oximeter probes with adhesive sensors may minimize motion and may yield more accurate results than non-adhesive sensors. Even though it is easy to use, the pulse oximeter can produce erroneous data in certain circumstances. One common problem is the occurrence of movement artifacts when there is movement at the site where the probe is placed. This may interfere with proper function and most often occurs if a patient is shivering, 
has seizures, or is being transported by ambulance or helicopter. The waveform of the pulse oximeter will be distorted in such circumstances, and the clinician should recognize that the measurement displayed is inaccurate. A bright light, such as an operating room lamp, may cause light interference, leading to an erroneous reading. Electromagnetic radiation, such as that emitted from an MRI scanner, may also interfere with pulse oximetry. If the probe is poorly placed or is the wrong size, light from only one light-emitting diode may pass through the tissues, or the light may not reach the detectors. This will result in falsely elevated or depressed results. Nail polish that absorbs light at 660 nanometers or 940 nanometers may also interfere with the pulse oximeter and result in an inaccurate reading. This problem can be avoided by removing the nail polish. The presence of intravascular dyes such as methylene blue or indigo carmine may alter the red and infrared light absorption properties of the blood and tissues, also resulting in an inaccurate reading. Non-functional hemoglobin can also result in inaccurate pulse oximeter data. At 940 nanometers, the light absorption of carboxyhemoglobin is minimal and does not affect the SpO2. However, at 660 nanometers, the light absorption of carboxyhemoglobin is similar to that of oxyhemoglobin. The pulse oximeter cannot differentiate between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin in this instance and may erroneously display a normal or near-normal arterial blood oxygen saturation when the actual arterial blood oxygen saturation may be low. At 940 nanometers, MET hemoglobin absorbs more light than either deoxyhemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin. At 660 nanometers, the light absorption of MET hemoglobin is similar to that of deoxyhemoglobin. In this instance, the pulse oximeter cannot differentiate between MET hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin and may incorrectly detect an elevated deoxyhemoglobin concentration, resulting in a falsely low interpretation of arterial blood oxygen saturation. Carboxyhemoglobin may cause a falsely high SpO2, whereas MET hemoglobin may cause a falsely high or falsely low reading, depending on the actual concentration of oxyhemoglobin. Newer pulse oximeters are able to emit light at up to eight different wavelengths. This increase in the number of available wavelengths makes it possible for the oximeter to distinguish carboxyhemoglobin and MET hemoglobin. There are additional limitations, peripheral vasoconstriction, hypoperfusion, hypothermia, shock, and anemia may also yield inaccurate results. If you do not get a reading from the pulse oximeter, either when you attach it to the patient or during use, there is a series of steps you can follow to determine the problem. First, make sure the probe has not fallen off the placement site. If it has been displaced, adjust the probe as necessary. If not, make sure the cable connecting the probe to the microprocessor is intact and is in fact connected to the microprocessor. The cable may become loose or detached, making it seem as though the pulse oximeter cannot determine the arterial blood oxygen saturation. If the cable is loose, adjust the connection as necessary. Next, make sure the red light on the inside of the probe is evident. If you do not see the red light, check the power cable. If you can see the red light and have made sure the cable connecting the probe to the microprocessor is intact, clean the probe and place it on your finger to see whether the issue is specific to the patient. If this is not the case, it is possible that either the probe or the microprocessor is not working properly. Replace the probe, the microprocessor, or both as necessary. Although the pulse oximeter is generally a safe device, its use still carries some risk of adverse events. Ischemic pressure necrosis may result if the probe is placed too tightly on the patient. Perioperative corneal abrasion may occur if a patient with a probe on a finger rubs his or her eyes when awakening from anesthesia and in doing so scrapes the cornea. 
Prolonged placement of a pulse oximeter probe, as may occur in patients in the ICU, may lead to mechanical injury, such as finger stiffness, making it difficult to flex the finger after removal of the probe. Although previously documented, these complications remain uncommon. If used correctly, pulse oximetry is a potentially life-saving tool. Healthcare providers need to be aware of the indications, benefits, and disadvantages of pulse oximetry. Most important, clinicians must be able to interpret the information pulse oximetry provides. With proper training and instruction, pulse oximetry is an invaluable monitoring tool.